Good day, grade 12s, and welcome to today's lesson. I'm Renee Bishop. I'm a Life Sciences Subject Advisor in BCM, and I'll be presenting paper one to you. So please make sure that you have a pen and paper on hand to take notes, and also don't forget to put your questions in the comments section so we can get back to you as soon as possible. So let's look at, have a look at what paper one brings for you. Firstly, let's have a look at the topics and weightings that we have in paper one. In paper one, there are five topics. The first topic, responding to the environment in humans, counts 54 marks of the paper, which is 36% of the paper and is the most important topic in the paper if you're wanting to score marks. Human reproduction covers 41 marks of the paper, which is 27%. The endocrine and homeostasis in humans covers 34 marks, which is 23% of the paper. Responding to the environment in plants counts only 13 marks, but is a very important topic in Life Sciences Paper 1, and it's often where the scientific investigation is asked. Reproduction in vertebrates covers eight marks, which is only 5% of the paper. Let's look at some tips for success. Firstly, read questions thoroughly with understanding and follow instructions. It's a good idea to always have a ruler on hand all right, to help you to guide you through the question and to focus on the question. Very often learners do not read the question correctly and therefore do not answer the question correctly. Take note of the mark allocation. If the mark allocation is for only two marks, do not write a half a page paragraph for those two marks as you'll be wasting a lot of time. Also, if the question is a six mark question, ensure that you are writing enough information to gain six marks. In question 1.1, which is the multiple choice question, please ensure that you write only one letter. Many learners write both A and B for a, quest for a question. If the answer is A and you think it could also be B. Do not write both letters. Even though A is correct, you will be marked wrong because you have written two letters instead of one. Also read clearly as to how many points are needed. You'll see in Life Sciences paper that we put highlight the number of reasons or points that we are expecting. If you are asked for two reasons or two structures, only write down two reasons or structures. If you are writing more than two, they won't be marked. Read carefully. When letter and name is asked for, ensure that you are writing both the letter and the name. Many learners leave this out and only write the letter or the name and therefore lose a mark. Concentrate on your spelling when you're learning. And you can only do this by writing out your work as you are learning. Many learners lose marks because of incorrect spelling and mixing up of terminology. Some very common mistakes are axon and auxin. They sound very similar to each other, but they have different spelling. Corion and choroid. Ensure that you know which is which. Glucagon and glycogen. Right? These two are often confused and learners lose unnecessary marks. Blastocyte and blastocyst. Right? Remember the blastocyte is the blastula. Right? And a blastocyst is another structure which is not in the grade 12 syllabus. So ensure that you have the right spelling as you do not want to lose that easy mark. Also make sure that you understand the question and what the question is asking. It's important to highlight or underline the action verb when you are reading through the question. 
Questions like describe are, are asking you to give a detailed account including all relevant information. Okay? So give a step-by-step -step account of the situation that you are ask, being asked to describe. Explaining questions are questions that need you to write a statement and elaborate or give a reason for your answer. We say that they are a cause and effect type of question. Make sure that when you are answering an explained question, all right, you write a sentence that is worth two marks. Let's look at the scientific investigation. Now, the scientific investigation is asked in both paper one and paper two. And by now, you are very used to having a scientific investigation in every one of your exam papers. This is an area where you can actually gain very easy marks, all right, and something that you should have learned since grade 10. So let's make sure that you are not losing those easy marks. Let's start with the aim. Every investigation has to have an aim. And we recognize the aim by the sentence which says to investigate or to determine. Right? These words are guiding words to where the aim of the investigation is. If we take a look at the investigation that's on your screen, this comes from the trial paper for the Eastern Cape in paper one. Right? As we read the sentence, it's very important right, to, to underline the aim straight away as you are reading. Right, so here it says the researchers investigated the effect of microplastic bioaccumulation on the male fertility levels in rats. Okay, so we recognize this as the aim, as they say, this is what they investigated. Now, the aim is a very important part of your scientific investigation because it's going to help you to answer other questions in this section of work. So my suggestion is always to highlight or underline that aim in your paper as you are reading. The conclusion. Now the conclusion normally comes at the end of your paper. But the reason we're looking at it here is because the conclusion speaks to your aim. All right, so it's important okay, that you know and understand that your conclusion should be answering what your aim is asking. So in this investigation, we were looking at the effect of microplastic bioaccumulation in male fertility levels in rats. Now, if we look at the data that was given to us in the table, we'll see that the investigator looked at testosterone levels. Now, the investigator was using testosterone levels to measure the male fertility in rats. Many learners in their trial exam wrote that the effect of microplastic bioaccumulation was that when microplastic bioaccumulation increased, the testosterone levels decreased. Now, they were marked wrong for this because testosterone levels are not mentioned in the aim. If we look at the aim, we are measuring male fertility in rats. So the correct conclusion should be, as microplastic bioaccumulation increases, the male fertility levels in rats decreases. Ensure that the words you are using in your conclusion are the same words that you have used in your aim. Okay, the conclusion must answer the aim. The next thing we're going to look at is the independent and dependent variable. Now, the independent and dependent variable must be read from the aim, right? And that's why it's important that you underline the aim in your investigation as you were reading. Right, so in our aim, we have two variables. We have microplastic bioaccumulation and we have male fertility levels in rats. Now the independent variable, okay, is the variable that is being tested. 
It is the variable that is manipulated by the scientists in this investigation. In this investigation, our independent variable was microplastic bioaccumulation. All right. Now, many learners lose a mark because they write the effect of microplastic bioaccumulation. The effect of is not the factor. The factor is microplastic bioaccumulation. And therefore, if the learner writes effect of microplastic bioaccumulation, they're going to get that wrong in the examination. So make sure you're only writing the factor and you are not writing a sentence with the words effect of. The dependent variable is the variable that we are going to measure. Once again, we look at the aim and we get the dependent variable from the aim, not from the table. And be very clear on this. It's very important that you do not look at the table for your dependent variable, as we're going to see that this often differs. We must look at the aim. Right. So in our aim, it said we are looking at the effect of microplastic bioaccumulation on male fertility levels in rats. That is what we are measuring, the male fertility levels in rats. So this is our dependent variable. Now, in this case, right, let's look at why it was not testosterone level. We were looking at male fertility levels in rats, but we cannot measure male fertility by just looking at the rats. We have to have a way to measure it. And in this investigation, the scientists decided that they would look at testosterone level as an indicator of male fertility. Remember that if testosterone level is high, it indicates that the male would be very fertile. If the testosterone levels are low, it could indicate that the male is infertile. So they looked at testosterone levels to tell them what the fertility levels in the rats were. So very often in the metric paper nowadays, you get asked, how is the dependent variable measured? In other words, how is male fertility in rats measured in this investigation? To find out how it was measured, we are going to look at the table or the graph not at the aim. The table and the graph will tell us how the dependent variable was measured. And in this case, we looked at testosterone level to measure the dependent variable. So be careful when they are asking you this question in an exam. Are they asking you what is the dependent variable? Or are they asking you how was the male fertility measured? In other words, how was the dependent variable measured. Here's another example. Okay. All right. So in this example, the aim was to determine the influence of temperature on the growth of chickens. Now, in this investigation, temperature was our independent variable, whereas growth of chickens was our dependent variable. But if we look in this investigation and we looked at the table, we saw that they measured the average mass of the chicken. So in this investigation, the dependent variable was the growth of chicken and how the dependent variable was measured, all right, was the average mass of the chickens. reliability and validity. Now these are two important factors in an investigation and they refer to how the scientists carried out the investigation. So when we look at a scientific investigation in our papers, we'll see that the scientific investigation is laid out in three parts. The first part of your scientific investigation right, is the write-up which would explain why the scientists are doing the uh, investigation and uh, what they were hoping to achieve. 
The second part of your scientific investigation is this area here with the dots. All right, we often see it highlighted with dots down the side. And this is the procedure. In other words, this is how the scientists carried out the investigation. The last part of your investigation is either a table or a graph which represents the results. Now, when we speak about reliability and validity, we're speaking about how the investigation was carried out. So the answers for reliability and validity will be found in this section, all right, on how the investigation will be carried out. Okay, so let's first look at, at the reliability of an investigation. Now, when we look at reliability, there are four things that can improve your reliability. Reliability means that if I did this investigation again, would I get the same results? Whereas validity means that if I did this investigation, am I doing it correctly? In our next section, we are going to look at what makes an investigation reliable and what makes an investigation valid. So tune in for the next lesson where we cover the second part of scientific investigation on validity and reliability. Thank you.